Um, I've been reading through the book of Jeremiah. It's caught something. Jeremiah is one of the few books and few prophets that you knew he had a sidekick. You know, there's Batman and Robin and, and uh, all, all the famous stuff, Fred and Barney and everything. Well, when you come to most of them, you don't know of somebody else, most of the prophets. But when you come to Jeremiah, there was Baruch. And in chapter 45 of Jeremiah, he gives a small, this isn't going to be long, a small message to Baruch. And it's important that you notice the date. He says in that, he says, the word, of, uh, the word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written those words in the book of the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. Now, we won't go there, but back in chapter 36, you have a record of that. The book of Jeremiah is not in, in chronological order. It's over concepts and ideas. And in chapter 30, um, 36, it was in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was one of the more wicked kings, especially after Josiah. There was four kings, and he was one of the worst ones. He uh, absolutely ki he killed one prophet. He killed the prophet, talked about, warned him, and then ran to Egypt. He sent out people to get the man, Ahijah, bring him back just so he could watch him die. That's the kind of man he was. Well, God had uh, Jeremiah gave him a prophecy and says, write it in a book. But now Jeremiah didn't actually write it. Baruch did. Baruch was the one that actually was the writer. And it actually, in that passage, gives us a little picture of the concept of inspiration and inscripturation. Because God gave it to Jeremiah, who gave it to Baruch. So God had to make sure not only that he gave it to Jeremiah, but did he have to make sure that Baruch wrote it right? Yeah. Well, he writes it on out, and then Baruch has to go prophesy. And they say, how'd you get this? And he says, I got it from Jeremiah. And they said, um, go hide yourself and Jeremiah. And they take the book, take it to Jehoiakim and read it. And you know the story. It's a cold night. And as he reads it, it's the scroll he gets to a certain point. He takes a knife and cuts a portion off and throws it in the fire. And did that till the whole scroll was burned up. And it says he did not fear. Even though these other men did, he didn't fear. And uh, he says, go find Jeremiah and Baruch. Now, what was he going to do? Same thing he had done to, uh, to, to Ahijah. Well, he doesn't find him. Now, that seems to be maybe the one of the first times we hear of Baruch. He's throughout this whole book. Uh, and his brother has a part in this book as well. But I find it interesting. This is written at that same time. And he, he tells Baruch this, and I think it's important that we kind of pay attention to this as we look at this passage of scripture. He has given him a promise because he's going to be with Jeremiah all the way to the end of the book when they're basically forcibly taken to Egypt later on. But at this point, notice what it says uh, about the fact that he's going to destroy basically Egypt, I mean Israel, Judah. It says, verse 4, Thus shalt thou say unto him, The Lord saith this, Behold, that which I have will I break down, built up will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. Now notice this next part. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Seek them not. And he goes on and promises that he's going to protect Baruch. In other words, Baruch's never going to die from a tragedy or being murdered or something. God's going to protect him. Now, what I find interesting is, if you know anything about Jeremiah, at the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, God promised him the same thing. But Jeremiah was also a guy that was kind of down sometimes, discouraged, wasn't he? He gives up at time. But Jeremiah is told, you give pretty much that same message to Baruch. And he tells him, you seek great things for yourself. I, I suppose that he's probably a younger guy at that time. He's seeking great things. He had dreams of what he wanted his life to be. What was God saying? Don't seek them. He says, this place is going to... He says, why do you seek things in a place that's going to be destroyed? Now, now I want to catch... One of the things that's bothered me during this time, and it's bothered me for years, but, and we're all guilty of it, we've sought great things. 
I grew up in an era, uh, I actually heard a preacher one time say, the more faithful you are to God, the bigger church God will give you. Uh, that man, uh, even at a young age, I was probably 19 or 20, and I knew something was wrong. And it was proven to be so. So we've seen during this time several famous or well-meaning people fall and, and fail. What, are we, what, what have we been called to? Make a name for ourselves? Seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. This place is, whether it's by the coronavirus or, or if it goes on for another thousand years, this place is going to be destroyed. Right? And what we need to do is be doing the work of God. And we need to be very careful that we don't seek great things. It's hard. This world and even this world's religious system, and I'm talking about Christianity, tells us what greatness as far as a preacher is. And the older I get, the more I realize that sometimes I have been sucked into believing wrong things as far as what spiritual greatness is and what my job is as a pastor. It's not about me. They're not supposed to be entertained by me or even necessarily be uh, remembering that much greatness about me. But what I'm supposed to be doing is when they, when, they, when they see me stand up in the pulpit, they need to be seeing Jesus because that's, that's who I'm supposed to be lifting up. And as I lift up myself, they aren't going to see Jesus. So I'm just, I want to challenge you. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Seek to lift up Jesus.